This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to The Commercial Investing Show, where we analyze, explain, and exploit the opportunities presented in today's commercial property marketplace. If you're interested in apartments, mobile home parks, self-storage facilities, and other income property, you've come to the right place. We'll explore what's hot and what's not in markets nationwide in the relentless pursuit of return on investment. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Thank you for joining us. I am here with a live interview. We don't get to do too many live interviews, so this is really exciting. With a prior guest who is returning to the show, and that is none other than Brent Johnson, CEO of Santiago Capital and the creator of the dollar milkshake theory, which is a very famous cool theory that we'll give him just a second to explain that to you because I think that's important. Brent, it's good to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. We've been talking about doing this for, I think, nine months or something. We finally get around to doing it. it. It's been a while. And last time we were on Zoom, of course, but since we're both speaking at this conference, it's great to be able to talk to you in person and do this in person. So first of all, since you are so famous for it, just tell us about the dollar milkshake theory real quick. And this, by the way, plays into the debate about the value of U.S. dollars as the global reserve currency and so forth and how important that is and why it may or may not continue. Yeah, sure. Thanks for inviting me on to do it again. To make it very simple, the dollar milkshake theory is really just a framework for how I see the markets playing out in the years ahead. Now, I started talking about this in 2018, really kind of ramped it up in 2019 because I thought we were approaching a sovereign debt and currency crisis because of all the huge debts in the world. Now, we haven't had the sovereign debt and currency crisis. We had a pandemic crisis, Mm -hmm. which kind of kicked everything down the road. So I think we will still have a debt crisis, but I'm not smart enough to know whether it comes next week or next year. Mm -hmm. But I manage money for a number of high net worth individuals. And so while I'm always trying to make money, I always have to be on the lookout for these rogue waves that come and, you know, cause a big uh, drawdown. Sure. And I'm of the belief that debt does matter. At some point, there will be consequences. So I had to come up with a framework and a way of explaining to my clients what I thought would happen if this ever happened. Okay, so before you go ahead, debt does matter. You're talking about U.S. debt, right? We were $35 trillion or so. That's what you're talking about, right? Well, I'm, I am talking about that, but I'm also talking about all the debt in the other parts of the world. Okay. And that the distinction that you just made is actually a key part of, of the thesis. And I think and Because I think what happens is a lot of people, for many good reasons, the U.S. is the global hegemon, it's the biggest uh, economic market in the world. A lot of people from around the world sell their goods in the United States. And as a result, everybody focuses on the U.S.'s economic situation. And if you analyze the U.S. economic situation in isolation, the only conclusion you can come to is that we are way over our skis, we've you know, spent way too much money, we've taken on too much debt, and it's gonna end really badly. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people do that analysis and come to that conclusion and therefore think the not only is the U.S. empire going to fall, but the dollar is going to get inflated away and go to zero. And I used to think that way myself. Mm-hmm. But the problem with doing that is we don't live in an isolated country. Right. It's a global world. And it's a question, of course, of compared to what? Exactly. Because you can you can argue about how bad the U.S. is and how poorly managed it's been, but compared to everybody else. That's exactly right. And so my mistake many, many years ago was that I did that analysis on the United States and I basically looked at it in isolation in a vacuum. And again, you come to some really terrifying conclusions right, when sure. you do that. Once I started looking around the world and analyzing the other countries to the same extent that I was analyzing, I, I said, holy cow, the world has a big problem. Yeah. But on a relative basis, the U.S. is actually in better shape than the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. Or if you think they're not in better shape, they have a number of advantages that the rest of the world doesn't have, which I think yeah. will allow them to manage, quote unquote, the crisis Mm -hmm. better than some other countries. Right. And when you say crisis, you mean the debt crisis. What Define debt crisis. Let let me take a step back. The entire monetary system is a debt-based monetary system. So money gets loaned into existence. Mm -hmm. And as money gets loaned into existence, you know, the economy grows, asset prices rise. But for that to continue, money needs to continually get loaned into existence. If it doesn't, then it starts to contract. Mm -hmm. And in the credit contraction, you start to get defaults. Yep. And when one default happens, it has the potential to cause another to default to happen. Domino effect. So we have a system that expands and contracts, expands, and but over time it goes like this. The problem is if you let it contract for too big a period of time, it'll collapse. Mm-hmm. 
That is why whenever we do get these credit contractions, sometimes if they're very severe, you get monetary authorities, central banks and governments coming in to backstop the yep. contraction. Right. And the issue that we have now is that the whole world is in this situation. Mm-hmm. For a long time, if one country got in trouble or one region got in trouble, you just take your capital from there and you go somewhere else. Problem now is we're very much in a globalized world. Everybody has these big debts. The rest of the world has as much debt in U.S. dollars as the United States has in U.S. dollars. So to your point yeah. at the beginning, everybody knows the United States has like $35 trillion of debt. It's an astronomically large number. It can never be paid off. Right. What most people don't know is that the rest of the world, entities outside the United States, owe $35 trillion or more mm-hmm. in U.S. dollars as well. Yeah. And they don't owe it to the United States. They owe it to each other. This is the euro dollar system, mm-hmm. All right. which has gone largely unnoticed by many people for yeah. many years. This Smite. Smiter's trying to kind of yeah. make that famous. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Sure. So yeah. despite the fact that it's the biggest market in the world, many people don't know about it, mm-hmm. especially people in the U.S., because people in the U.S. only have to think in one currency. Mm-hmm. If you grew up anywhere in the world other than the United States, you learned to think in two currencies, yeah. lower Euro currency and the dollar, and U.S. dollar. Yeah. Right. And so this kind of get the dollar milkshake theory says, yes, if we get into one of these crises, the governments, the monetary authorities, they will try to save the system. They will probably do that by printing more money or doing bailouts or doing stimulus. Mm-hmm. But I think all that new money, that liquidity that gets created in response to a crisis will get sucked up into the United States. Mm-hmm. And so that's the milkshake. You know, the central banks, and the monetary, they, they will mix this liquidity. But for many reasons, again, some deserved, some undeserved, the U.S. has many advantages, I think, will pull that capital into the United States. And it deprives capital to the rest of the world. So you get this kind of vicious cycle. So I think we could have a big blow off top in the U.S. where everybody else is, is experiencing you know, economic pain to a greater degree than the United States. Mm-hmm. And, it does, and it doesn't mean that things are good. I want to be clear. It doesn't right. mean things are good in the U.S., just better than elsewhere. It's compared to what is always the question. Yeah. So the milkshake is the idea. And I know you got that from a movie and you, maybe you can explain that real quickly. But the milkshake, you know, with a milkshake, you have a straw. Yeah. Right. So tell us about that and the sucking up of dollars. Sure. Yeah. So. The reference coming from a movie called There Will Be Blood, and uh-huh. it's about this ruthless oil executive who just all he wants to do is grow his business and crush his competitors. Uh-huh. And one of his neighbors is trying to sell him his property. He says, listen, if you buy my property, you can have all the oil underneath it. Right. And he says, well, you know, I really don't need to buy your property because I have a straw. Yeah. And if I stick the straw down into the ground on my side of the fence, yeah. I can still get the oil. up that oil. Right. I can, he says, I can drink your milkshake. Mm-hmm. The U.S. has many advantages that the rest of the world doesn't. Again, it's the biggest global market. So anybody from around the world who produces things wants to sell it into the United States. Everybody has U.S. dollar debt in the world. So everybody needs U.S. dollars. To repay the debt. To repay the debt. And if they don't repay the debt and they default on it, again, they're defaulting on each other. They're not defaulting on the United States. Because in the euro dollar market, it's a bank in England making a loan to a corporation in Turkey. Or it's Japan, a Japan manufacturer doing dollar-based vendor financing to a supplier in the Philippines. So again, they're not, all these loans don't come from JP Morgan or Bank of America. It could be Deutsche Bank extending a loan to an Italian manufacturer. So if, if those loans get defaulted on, they're not defaulting on a U.S. institution, they're defaulting on an international institution, which causes that contraction that we talk about. Wouldn't it be fair to say that that's kind of like, you know, in the old system, which is not fractional reserve banking, fractional reserve lending, right? But in the traditional banking idea, yeah. right, of, the, of, of old, yeah, uh, you know, a bank takes deposits and then it makes loans and it acts as this arbiter of this sure. scenario, right? Isn't that what the U.S. is doing? So they wouldn't be defaulting on the U.S. How are they defaulting on each other? Because the U.S. is the arbiter like the old-fashioned bank of that. Is that right? So the U.S. sits in the center of it. But again, if, if, a, if a bank in France yep. extends a dollar-based loan to a company in Turkey mm-hmm. and the Turkish corporate goes bankrupt, it's the bank in France that's losing the dollars. It's not the bank in America that's losing the dollars. Oh, so it's just because of the dollar being the reserve currency then. And it's and it's the it's the denomination of the loan that has been extended. Yeah. So if, if France was extending the loan in Turkish lira, it wouldn't be the same situation or or, or in your euros, but the pro, the issue is that after World War II, the US became yep. global reserve currency. Shortly after that, right. countries outside the United States started trading with each other in dollars just because it was the global reserve currency. Yep. In 1973, when the U.S. signed the deal with Saudi Arabia, the oil for dollars, Mm -hmm. it made the whole world need dollars to buy oil. So over that time period, this huge market for dollars grew up outside the United States. And and that market is much bigger than the market for dollars inside the United States. Right. That's really interesting. That's a really interesting point right there. 
And everybody needs to just realize the absolute brilliance of the way the U.S. It, just won that deal. Yeah. You know, from Bretton Woods onward, I mean, it put the U.S. in an incredible position. You know, I would argue really. that is the greatest deal in in, in history. history. Yeah. It's better than the the right. you know Seward's possess, uh, purchase of Alaska. It's better than the Louisiana yeah. purchase. Yeah, I mean, I put it because it's it's it's. It's allowed, it allowed them to not only stay the hegemon, but extend their hegemony to a greater extent. Right. And I would argue that the second greatest, maybe, con in history would be 1971 when Nixon closed the gold window. I mean, because somehow all of the world just kept on doing the same deal. Well, that's, after. Why, that's why it's so important. Had When he cut the, the gold yeah. fr- from the, 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 yeah. The, yeah, the, the the peg to, the, to gold, for the next year and a half, there was a lot of volatility and there was questions whether the, the U.S. dollar would remain right. global reserve currency. So this deal that, you know, the U.S. signed with Saudi Arabia, it was critical to not only keep the global reserve currency, mm-hmm. but to solidify it. Right. Yeah. So, so so that came about a year and a half after the, yeah. the Nixon speech, that's right. the famous speech. That, that's interesting. So, you know, I'm not a believer in MMT or modern monetary theory. However, I do think it has some brilliance to it for sure. And it sounds like that plays into what you're saying. Because the, the one of the brilliant things about MMT, which I am not a believer in, I think it's kind of a fantasy, okay, honestly, but this whole idea of creating a need for your own currency by issuing debt and then require, or taxes, yeah. and requiring it to be paid back in that currency creates demand for the, it's a, that's a brilliant circle. Exactly. It's a, you, to your point, I think my guess is if we sat down and really went through it, yeah. I think you would agree that MMT is the way things are currently working. They, they kind of are. But yeah. taking them to their extreme extent mm-hmm. yeah. would blow things up. Right. Um, and so I often tell people, don't ignore MMT because MMT, in my opinion, explains the way the system works, mm-hmm. whether you like it or not. Right. It's just if you took it to its full extent, it ends badly. And yeah. so, and so to your, again, to your point, MMT is important to understand. Again, the, the 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 U.S. has the ability to print the money. Yeah, and the thing is, they don't even really have to print it. They can just spend it and then tax it back, or, or the, the the debt that's associated with it creates demand for it. Loan it into existence. Loan it into, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. So the question is, you know, I mean, with all of the doomers out there, yeah, um, you know, led by maybe Peter Schiff, he's been on the show before, and of course you've debated with him. How long can we keep this game up? Yeah, I think is you know. At some point, you said if MMT is extended to its, you know, it wouldn't work at some point. And I agree with you. But can we just kind of keep playing this game for a long while? Well, I think I think we can play longer than most people think. Yeah. I, so I am of the opinion, again, because the debts are enormous. Yeah. And, you know, Mike Green has talked about passive investing and how the rise of passive investing could cause everything to go up together, but can also cause everything to go down to the very down together very quickly. Mm-hmm. So I think you need to be prepared for a bad outcome. Mm-hmm. But I don't think you should be betting everything right. on the bad outcome because yeah. I do think this can go on longer than many people think. Yeah. Again, so I've been in this business for 25 years now. Mm-hmm. I started just before the dot-com crash in 1999. Mm-hmm. And in 2000 and 2001, people were saying this is the end. And mm-hmm. then miraculously, we had a, a boom. And then it happened again in 2008. People people said, this too. is the end, yeah. right? Yeah. And then we had COVID and people said, this is the end. But you know, here we are, we're back at the highs. The plates are still spinning. I think there's a lot of people, especially the doomers, yep. who think central bankers are a bunch of stupid idiots who yep. don't know what's going on. And I think that's the wrong way to think about it. Mm-hmm. I think they're actually incredibly smart yep. people. And uh, perhaps they practice voodoo that you don't agree with, but they've kept the plates spinning mm-hmm. longer than many people have have predicted. It would not surprise me at all if this goes on for another five or ten years. I think it oh, could easily happen that's it. years from now. I would think it could go on, on much longer than that. Sure, yeah. it, could. it absolutely could. And so that's, that's, I think people need to have a plan. Mm-hmm for bad things to happen, but I don't think you can just sit there on top of a mountain, top in isolation and say it's all going to happen tomorrow. Right. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, a whole bunch of thoughts come out of that, Brent. Number one is that famous quote, you know, how does the world end not with a bang, but with a whimper? Yeah. That speaks to the idea that this is just sort of a progressive thing. We're inflating away the debt, you know, for many, sadly, their economic situation gets a lot worse because they bear the brunt of that, that inflation. You know, it just sort of keeps going, and it's like this progressive thing, the idea of, you know, you keep kicking this can down the road. And then the other quote it reminds me of is uh, the investor complaining that the market's irrational, and I'm right. Well, the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. And and that's the thing that so many people, they think the jig is going to be up, and I think someday they'll be right, but it could be 100 years from now. You know, and what happens when the jig is up? Like, how does well, that look? So... 
I think part of this is related to, we, we're now in this culture of like instant gratification. Yeah. You know, swipe left, swipe right, <laughs> go on to the next post, right? Read this on Twitter, and then <laughs> you don't like it, go to the next one. Very short attention span. Very short attention yeah. span, right? And so I think people, because they're used to that kind of environment, they think that we're gonna have this big event, mm -hmm. everything's gonna get really bad, but then everything's gonna be solved, and then we're onto a new system, right. and everything's fine. Yeah. And I just don't think that's the way it is. I think, I you know, it could happen very quickly, but this could happen, this could, like we've just said, it could take five or 10 years. Mm -hmm. We could have moments of real craziness and then it gets good again, craziness and good again. So we could have another 20 years, like we've had the last 20 years, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Three different major crises, but yet everything is still functioning and asset prices are higher. That, that could easily happen. Um, but the thing that I think many people get wrong, and this is something that I hope doesn't happen, but I right. think is more likely to happen than not, is let's say we do have this big crisis. Let's mm -hmm. say we do have this big moment. Mm -hmm. I think more than likely what comes next is more authoritarianism mm -hmm. and more government control yep. than less. Agreed. A lot of times people will compare the United States to the, to Rome, mm -hmm. right? And there's a great book called The Storm Before the Storm. I don't know if you've read it, but I have you, not. you should read but it. But I know the Rome story. You know, it's fantastic. The, the this book takes place from like 110 BC to 60 BC. It's like a 50 or 60 year period. And eventually, you know, and all the parallels to the United States, are, it's incredible. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. But what people don't realize is after that book ends in 60 BC, mm -hmm. Rome still existed as the dominant power for the next 400 years. Yeah. <laughs> what came next was the dictators. Mm -hmm. That was the fall of the Republic. Right. But what came next was more authoritarianism, yeah. more uh, centrally controlled power. And that's my biggest fear is that's kind of where we're headed. Um, you know, again, I hope I'm wrong, but that's what it seems. Well, that's what we have seen so far, just, you know, in the last couple of decades. I mean, every crisis brings a new level of more laws, more intrusive situations with the government intruding into our lives. I mean, you know, in, in the past with my businesses, the idea of banking just used to be this thing in the background. Now, I spend hours every week on banking. Yeah. I mean, banking should just be like air. I don't think about it. Like a, it should be like a utility. Yeah. Out of like but, all encompassing. But, but with the, you know, with the Patriot Act and the Know Your Customer and that banking has become insanely complicated. Your bank just won't do anything for you anymore. You know, there's just a million regulations with everything. I used to never think about banking. It was this thing in the background. I just... And that, that will probably continue. Yep. I think we'll probably continue to see the small regional banks, mm -hmm. you know, be put to the wayside and the bigger banks will get bigger. I think. A, a good comparison might be doctors, right? And how you can't really have many doctors in private practice anymore because the burden of managing it's all the insurance and the, the complexity of that whole system, you know, a small, a small doctor can't do it anymore. That's it's just too complex. Yeah. And so the weight of this bureaucracy just keeps getting heavier and this authoritarianism keeps getting heavier. Right. But you know, that can go on for a long time. So, okay, what does the debt crisis end of the world scenario look like? Like if it happens in 10 years or, you know, a thousand years, well, what, what, I what is it? What, what happened? What I think happens is you start to have currencies around the world start to fall in value dramatically versus the U.S. dollar. All right. Because if we get into a situation where the U.S. has to print more money, the rest of the world's going to have to print more money too. Yeah. Because there's so much demand for dollars and there's not as much demand for the other currency. Mm -hmm. The dollar, even though that they're printing more of it, yeah probably rises in value versus other currencies. Right. That's a problem because all these other currencies or all these other countries have dollar debt. Mm -hmm. They earn. It gets more so onerous. It more onerous yeah. for them yeah. a bit. So as yeah. they start to, I think as they start to default, mm -hmm. you start to have a crisis, you know, jump from one country to another, mm -hmm. kind of a crescendo type thing. And I think as that's happening, I think the capital that is available, the liquidity that there is there, rushes back into the United States as, again, the relative right, the safe place. thorn. Yeah. I think probably what happens is we get a big blow off top of some kind. Mm -hmm. I think the dollar goes higher, and then gold goes higher. I think stocks go a lot higher. I think real estate prices probably go higher. Yeah. But then that will come to an end at some point too. And again, I don't know if that's a six month thing, a six year thing, or a 60 year thing. Yeah. But I, I think we have much higher to go before we have this ultimate crash. Now, it doesn't mean, I, I want to be clear, Everything's kind of at its high right now. Mm -hmm. Gold's at its high, yeah. the stocks, Bitcoin, yeah. real estate. We could easily have a correction. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wouldn't shock me at all. I kind of expect one. But I don't think this next correction is the final the final thing. Final thing. I, I, th I, yeah, I think this is going to take several years to kind of play out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and, you know, Brent, can you explain weak dollar, strong dollar versus inflation, deflation, sure. And I think people make a mistake with that because most people think of it as like within the United States, yeah. right? But it's really, how does it impact someone in the U.S. and then outside of the U.S. and the rest of the world? So I've always been clear since the very first time I mentioned the this dollar milkshake theory that I thought the U.S. dollar would rise versus other currencies. Mm -hmm. So it's a re again, it's a relative game. 
And the strong dollar, because the whole world runs on dollars, a stronger dollar tends to put pressure on countries whose currency isn't the dollar. Right. But it doesn't mean you can't have inflation. A lot of times people automatically think the dollar rises, that's deflationary. Right. All we got to do is go back to 2022. Mm -hmm. The dollar went to its 30 year high versus other currencies. And we had a we had raging inflation. Yeah. Right. So people need to like get that out of their mind. Uh -huh. um, because even the dollar may be rising versus other currencies, but it may be, it may be losing purchasing power. Mm -hmm. But here's here's why. It, it, but the loss of the purchasing power is within the U.S. Yes, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Outside the United States, it's if you're owning dollars, it's yeah. very strong. Right. And so, but and sometimes people will say to me, "Well, fiat versus fiat doesn't really matter. It only matters to currency traders." But that's completely wrong, and I'll tell you why. Is because even though you might be losing purchasing power, if you think the relative level of currencies doesn't matter, it's because you are a privileged American who has only had to think in one currency. Right. And because there's so much debt denominated in dollars, as the dollar rises versus other currencies, even if you're in an inflationary environment, the dollar rising can cause these short-term pull-downs, drawdowns, because that's what causes a credit contraction. The dollar rising is what causes these credit contractions that we've talked about. And during credit contractions, asset prices tend to fall. Mm -hmm. So you could have inflation, 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 boom, a big deflationary shock. Mm -hmm. Inflation, 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 boom. And so I, I think... Even if you're in an inflationary environment, which we are, mm -hmm. I don't think you can ignore the design of the system means that it's always prone to these deflationary shocks to the downside. Fair enough. However, deflation, I always say deflation is the worst of all economic maladies. So the central planners, I mean, that is probably the thing they are most fearful sure, of. Absolutely. Right. So they will always jump in and, you know, stop that from happening. Now, the question is, can they? Can they? And how levered are you during that drawdown phase? And can you, you know, can you stay liquid yeah. longer than the markets can stay? Right. Or yeah. So if you have a lot of leverage, you have to be able to stay in business mm -hmm. for them to come in and save it. Because they will come in and save yeah, it. Yeah, right. right? Yeah. But you it's know, in their interest. It's in their interest to save it. And it's in their interest to have inflation because they're inflating away their own debt. Sure. I mean, you know, yeah. one of my famous strategies is like your dollar milkshake to me is inflation induced debt destruction, yeah. right? You know, I say investors buy income properties, they use mortgage debt, they pay back the debt in cheaper dollars over time because the dollar is being debased. So their, yep. their debt, the servicing costs go down and their debt balance goes down vis-a-vis -vis inflation. And so the government wants inflation. I mean, the Fed officially wants yep. inflation at 2%. But, you know, when you owe money to China and you have inflation and you inflate away your own currency, yep. that's a great deal for you as the U.S., that's why governments all run on fiat currency. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because they can play this yeah. game. Yeah. They couldn't do it if it was tethered to gold, for example. Sure. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So any other predictions you want to share or anything you want to share? A question I didn't ask you just. The, you know, I'm perhaps naive in saying this, but I actually think I'll be able to manage the the, the, the financial craziness in the years ahead. I think the, the big uh, unknown for me is the social craziness that mm -hmm. I think is coming. Yeah. Um, I think we've seen that already. And I think as we move towards the election this fall. I think we're going to have an election where neither side accepts the other, mm -hmm. the outcome. One of the sides will not accept the outcome. And I think that's going to cause a lot of at least short-term volatility and strife. So my recommendation to people, and I, I say this all the time, is find people who you know, trust, and love who have an opinion different than yours mm -hmm. and talk to them mm -hmm. because it's going to be important. I, I, think, I think if you start like walling yourself off as it's 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 us against them right that's how things get really really bad yeah right and so um i think that's kind of where the politicians are pushing us mm -hmm. and so i i'm always like don't let the politicians push you there yeah and you know that's also in the past you know 20 something years how it's why this division keeps getting bigger is because the tech companies sort of push us into our echo chambers yeah. because the, all their algorithms feed us what we already believe and agree with right, right. and so uh you know it's we we have to understand we are being manipulated in that way. Uh, and, and, you know, it's literally just to sell advertising and products, but it works. Yeah. And, and it does make us more like ourselves, which is not always a good thing. Right. We need to be exposed to other points of view and other other ideas. So it's a very good point. Uh, Brent, give out your website. Oh, uh, yeah. So um, I have a website that's just SantiagoCapital.com that has my contact information. My, my business is managing money for high net worth individuals. I also do a, uh, show, a weekly show with my friend John Kutzmeta. It's called uh, Milkshakes, Markets, and Madness. Uh -huh. uh, you can find it uh, at Milkshakes Pod on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm under Santiago Capital on Twitter. And uh, if anybody wants to join us, we'd be love to have them. Good stuff. Brent Johnson, thanks for joining us. 
Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.